Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eli. Um, I'm a, a machine learning fellow on the Pyro team here at the Broad. Um, and in today's primer, I'm going to tell you about uh, black box variation line friends, which is a kind of a, a, a modern twist on the, the classic technique of, of variation line friends for, um, for uh, Bayesian inference. Uh, as Murtaj said, please feel free to interrupt um, throughout the talk, just, uh, chime in with questions. Um, if you'd like to follow along with the slides, there's a link here. Um, I can copy it into the Zoom chat. Um, yeah, I'll just, with that, I'll, I'll kick off. So uh, before we before we get into the details of, of variational inference, um, Let's let's start by reminding ourselves of the, the the how and the why of Bayesian inference and Bayesian machine learning. So I think typically when when um, you know when people think about applying machine learning to a problem they have, a data analysis problem, they they um, you know uh, they find themselves in a in a situation kind of exemplified by this flowchart I took from from Scikit-Learn, where uh, they're, uh, they they look at some kind of basic characteristics of their problem, and there are you know, a handful of buckets that that uh, their their problem might fall into. Um, and if 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 you're you're lucky enough that your problem does fall into one of those buckets, then you can use one of these kind of uh, fantastic off-the-shelf uh, tools that, that uh, Scikit-Learn or, or other software provides. Um, unfortunately, you know, especially in science, uh, we often find ourselves in these, in these kind of pathological uh, you know, orphan states in this flowchart where we either, we're either told, you know, if we want to use, if we want to get ourselves back into one of these buckets, we'll need to either get more data um, or else we're just Kind of out of luck for whatever reason. Uh, it just doesn't fit. Uh, we just can't quite fit our, our square problem peg into this round machine learning hole. So uh, what we might look for or hope for instead is, is a, a kind of a, a systematic unifying approach to solving machine learning problems. And one such approach uh, that we'll be focusing on in this primer uh, and the talk that follows by Fritz is uh, uh, Bayesian modeling and inference, uh, Bayesian machine learning. In Bayesian machine learning, we solve machine learning problems by um, repeating three you know, basic steps in, uh, in a loop that's, uh, that is often called uh, Box's loop after a famous statistician, George Box. Uh, who uh, wrote it down in the 70s. So the first step in, in um, Bayesian machine learning is defining a, a model, a probabilistic model. That is, we define and write down a joint probability distribution over uh, all of the observed variables in our problem. Uh, so all, all of the, 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 the data that we have and all of the variables that are unobserved. Uh, that could be missing data. It could be uh, things we might traditionally think of as parameters um, and lots of other things. And once we've written down a model, we then the, the second step is to perform uh, Bayesian inference, uh, which means computing this conditional distribution, the posterior distribution, over the latent variable z given the observed variable of x. Uh, and after computing the posterior distribution, uh, uh, we're not we're we're not quite done. We'd like to uh, uh, make sure that uh, our model makes sense, and we'd like to be able to use it to make predictions on new data. And Bayesian inference, Bayesian modeling and inference provides us with a, a kind of systematic solutions for, for those things as well. So to illustrate this, this workflow, 
Um, we'll look at a classic example uh, from uh, a popular statistics textbook, which is the uh, uh, which is building a Bayesian model for the effect of rugged terrain on on economic development. In particular, the question, the kind of uh, data science question that we'd like to answer is, did rugged terrain affect economic development in countries inside and outside of Africa differently? Uh, and to try and answer this question uh, quantitatively, rigorously, we're going to try modeling the, the GDP of the in the year 2000 of a number of, of African and non-African countries as a linear function of terrain ruggedness, uh, where the, the, the measure of terrain ruggedness is some uh, average over uh, the country's topography. Uh, now, as you, as you might imagine, uh, there aren't that many countries and economies are complicated. And so, uh, this is, this is definitely a situation where uh, we'd fall into the kind of uh, get more data or tough luck buckets that we saw in the, the, the uh, machine learning flow chart in the beginning. And so we're forced to turn to using, uh, or, or we'll, we'll choose instead to, to turn to Bayesian regression, Bayesian linear regression, where we treat the, these regression coefficients, beta, uh, uh, and alpha as unknown random variables, latent random variables. Uh, and a quick uh, a quick note before we go on um, uh, on notation, uh, since you'll you'll be seeing a lot of this. This is probably familiar for for a lot of you, but uh, it's useful uh, to remind yourself. Uh, we, we describe in, in, in Bayesian machine learning, we like to describe probabilistic models, uh, joint probability distributions with uh, directed acyclic graphs where circular nodes indicate random variables and edges between nodes indicate dependence um, in, in a statistical or probabilistic sense. So for example, we can, when we look at the node y, y in in this diagram, uh, we can see that it depends on uh, it has arrows, in, incoming arrows from, from the nodes alpha, beta, x, and sigma. So we know that, that the conditional probability distribution of yn will, will depend on, on those four variables. Unshaded nodes, so the white nodes like alpha or beta are latent variables. Shaded nodes are, are observed variables, which means that we know their values. And finally, plates, uh, which is this, this rectangle with that's drawn around xn and yn indicate independent copies of the random variables inside. That is the, the, the joint, the, the probability distribution of over uh, uh, yn factors into this product of, of copies of the same conditional distribution. Okay, so now let's let's look at the, the Bayesian model that we're going to use uh, for uh, modeling uh, the effect of terrain on GDP. So we're just going to use our, uh, uh, you know, the standard linear regression that we saw, except that we're, we're now going to put uh, prior probability distributions on all of the regression coefficients. So alpha and beta, in this case, there are three regression coefficients. There's one for ruggedness feature, one for uh, whether the, the indicator feature of whether a country is in Africa or not, and one for a multiplicative interaction. Uh, and we're also going, we're also now going to put a prior distribution on a, a, a scale for the observations because uh, we expect there to be a, a, a lot of variance that's not explained by such a, such a simple model. All right, so now that we've completed step one of of uh, an iteration of box of loop, uh, we can kind of turn the crank of, of Bayesian inference and uh, attempt to answer the question that 
we set out initially to study uh, about the effect of, of terrain on, on economic development. And to do so, uh, we're going to break that question down in, into um, two parts. So the first part is, uh, does our model assign high probability to the data? Does it generate, uh, after performing Bayesian inference for the regression coefficients, does, does, the, does the model generate data that looks at least notionally similar uh, to, the, to the, the real data, the training data? Uh, and if the answer is yes, then we can proceed to um, you know, our actual analysis of whether uh, the slope of the regression line uh, relating ruggedness of terrain to GDP is different for African and non-African countries. So we're going to look at these two uh, posterior distributions, one over, um, uh, over two, uh, two different regression coefficients. So in answer to our, our first quantitative question of whether our, our model does, uh, whether our Bayesian linear regression model does a good job of capturing the data distribution, uh, it would appear from this visualization uh, that, that the answer is yes. So what you see here is uh, the data separ separated into non-African and African nations uh, um, on each, uh, in each plot, the, the data, the, uh, Original data is, is plotted in orange, and the uh, regression line in the 95% uh, quantile uh, is drawn in blue. And we can see that uh, in both cases, the, uh, the orange points fall almost entirely within this, this blue uh, uh, interval. So even though our model is uncertain, uh, the uncertainty is doing a good job of, of uh, capturing the, doing a decent job of capturing the, the, the data distribution. So we can confidently uh, attempt to use this model um, to answer our, our uh, I, scientific question. I, well, I, I have a question, if you can go sure. to the previous slide. Uh, I think it was written before that we were thinking of log GDP as being Gaussian with certain parameters. And when I look at the data, it is true that most of the points fall within the confidence interval, but I'm not sure I feel like they're more dense around the mean prediction. In other words, I'm not sure about the Gaussianity. Uh, that's right, but remember that this, uh, the, the posterior predictive distribution here, this uh, P of, which is what's being visualized, um, uh, it's going to be uh, wider than expected because we've we've uh, included uncertainty in uh, the scale sigma as well as in the parameters. Um, but yeah, I mean, there obviously this model is is uh, super limited. So the the posterior predictive is still Gaussian, but with a larger variance. Uh, Eli? Uh, I'm not sure if it's got, I think we might have to use a, a different prior for sigma if we wanted it to, to be uh, truly oh. Gaussian. Oh, yes, yeah. sigma, right, sigma's, sigma's random as well, so it's over dispersed. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, okay, so how would we, how would we go about answering the second question then? Um, well, um, uh, one thing we can do is, is look at these, is, is visualize these two posterior distributions uh, over, these, over these two different uh, slopes. So what we see here is, the, is uh, histograms visualizing those, those two uh, posterior probability densities. In the blue, we have the, the, the slope of the regression line, the distribution of, of slopes the regression line for uh, African nations, and in orange, uh, the distribution of slopes for non-African nations. And we can see that that the the bulk of the probability mass of the non-African nations are, are are on the negative side, and the bulk of, of, of the probability mass for the African nations is on the positive side. So, again, even though our our model is quite crude, uh, it seems like just, we've robustly identified. Um, uh, 
you know, a qualitative and quantitative difference in uh, the relationship between uh, rugged terrain and, and economic and, and GDP. Um, and so far, I, I haven't told you, you know, I've just been sort of pretending that we could do these uh, computations, these intervals in Bayesian inference exactly, um, or I haven't told you at all and, uh, about the details of the computations here. Eli, we have a question uh, in the audience from um, Luca Delisio. Mm -hmm. So he asked, what would the conclusion look like if we had done standard linear regression as opposed to Bayesian linear regression? Yeah, so um, one, um, I suppose there, there are two answers to that. I mean, one is that um, if we, the, the result of standard linear regression would, would basically be this, uh, this line here, uh, this, this um, center line, the dark blue line. Um, and because we're not fully capturing the, the uncertainty here, it, it, you know, it probably, probably using standard linear regression, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't allow us to draw useful conclusions because it, it would be uh, such a poor fit. Um, but also it's, you know, it's, it's not really, it's not really clear how you would do an analysis like this. Uh, there's, this is a this is a, sort of an inherently Bayesian computation here. We're we're looking at posterior distributions over uh, over parameters. We treat it as as random variables. Um, I think that that kind of illustrates this this uh, point I was trying to make earlier about. Uh, no. Uh, analyses that are kind of even a little bit off the beaten path um, requiring uh, a different approach, a systematic approach. Right. So, yeah, like I was saying, uh, we haven't, I haven't talked at all so far about how we, how we might go about uh, computing these distributions, the posterior distribution or the posterior predictive distribution that, uh, uh, we need in our, our Bayesian analyses. And there are lots of ways to do that. Um, sometimes you can do it by, you, you can do it exactly, you know, by hand on pen and paper. Um, maybe you've also heard of, of Markov Chain Monte Carlo uh, and then Martin CMC, uh, which is a very popular um, uh, approach. Uh, but for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, a different set of algorithms, which are collectively known as, as variational inference, uh, which you can think of as, as converting Bayesian inference to an optimization problem. In variational inference, we search for a, a in this nasty space of uh, all probability distributions represented by the gray circle, um, which includes some things that are that are extremely complicated computationally. Uh, we look for a a nice green region of uh, probability distributions that are simple to represent and simple to, to say sample from and look for within that region uh, a distribution, nice distribution that is that is as close in some sense as possible to the true posterior distribution. Another question. So what do we mean by, what do, what do I mean in this figure by, uh, uh, by close? Uh, what does it mean for um, an approximate distribution to be close to the true posterior? Well, it's sort of up to us, um, but there are lots of kind of natural constraints that we might place on, on the loss function that we use to measure closeness. We might, we, we'd ideally like it to be invariant to the parameterization of our uh, nice distributions Q and our uh, uh, and our true posterior p, we'd like it to ideally decompose over data points so that we can use 
um, stochastic optimization, data subsampling. We'd like it to be non-negative and zero only when the approximate posterior is equal to the true posterior. Um, these are all, I think, kind of things you might you might naturally come up with, even if you you'd never heard of Bayesian inference or variational inference before. And one such function, uh, is, these these constraints are actually quite strong. One such function that that satisfies them is the so-called Kullback Leibler divergence, the KL divergence, which again you may be familiar with, but it's useful to, to remind yourself of the definition and the the, the motivation. Uh, the definition of the KL divergence is here at the bottom of the slide. Uh, the expectation over our nice distribution uh, of the log ratio of uh, that distribution over the true distribution, uh, the true posterior. Set now, timer for 30 minutes. Your time. Uh, if you if you were looking at that uh, definition of the KL divergence and asking yourself, uh, well, how the heck are we supposed to compute this given that it seems like it, it requires knowing the, the true posterior in advance? How, how, how could this possibly be useful for variational inference? Um, then you would be absolutely right. Um, instead of using the KL divergence directly, we're going to have to use an approximation that only requires, uh, sorry, I keep, I keep seeing uh, questions pop up in the chat. Uh, right, we, we're going to use a, uh, an approximation that only requires evaluating the, our, our model, our joint distribution, uh, P of X and Z, rather than this intractable true posterior. And the approximation that we use is, is called the elbow, which is short for evidence lower bound. And we'll see later on uh, more what that means. Uh, we'll, we'll get into what that means. It turns out that uh, we can show that this this approximation is equal to uh, some arbitrary constant that doesn't depend on our, our uh, approximate posterior Q uh, minus the, the KL divergence that we're interested in. And because the constant C here doesn't depend on the, uh, um, the approximate posterior or its parameters, maximizing the elbow minimizes the, the KL divergence. So we now have a loss function that we can actually, uh, we can use for uh, variational inference. Now again, if you've, if you've come across variational inference before, uh, you may have heard that uh, it's, it's fast and scalable, uh, but also biased. That is, it's not guaranteed to find the true posterior. Because, uh, as we can see in this, in our, our kind of conceptual figure, the, the green ball, the green blob might not overlap with the, the, the true posterior distribution of interest. Uh, but it turns out that, that, you know, even though this, the, this notion of bias in our, our inferences can seem kind of, uh, scary in the abstract, uh, it's surprisingly, uh, easy to predict and even mitigate uh, with a bit of intuition. So in particular, uh, we might ask ourselves what sort of bias we see when we use this KL divergence as our, our loss function, our measure of closeness and uh, gradient descent or some other greedy, uh, greedy algorithm for optimizing, for searching through this, this, this green blob for optimizing our, our loss function. Uh, It turns out, so I've, I've shown here at the bottom of the slide uh, uh, some slightly complicated distribution uh, whose contours are shown in blue um, with a few different approximations in red uh, superimposed on top. And it turns out that uh, if we look at the, the definition of the KL divergence, 
we we would expect it to uh, systematically favor uh, approximations uh, like the one in the middle and the one on the right, where uh, some of the um, uh, which are underdispersed, where where some of the mass of the target distribution is is covered by is not covered by the approximation, as opposed to the one on the left, where uh, our approximation covers the entire high probability this high high mass region of the, the blue distribution, but also is kind of um, uh, covers regions where there's there's very little mass outside of these, these blue contours, and that's. Um, that's uh, apparent from this uh, uh, log ratio in the, the KL divergence. Uh, and because we're using a greedy, because you're, we're using um, greedy optimization algorithms, uh, you know, we may end up in, in kind of one, uh, one local minimum or the other, uh, so the one in the middle or the one on the right, depending on the details of our how our algorithm is initialized and implemented. Um, and so, as I said, uh, not only can this bias be um, you know, predicted and understood intuitively, even even without understanding the, the gritty details of the implementation of our of, of a particular uh, version of variational inference, um, we can also uh, uh, identify ways to mitigate it. So, so most prominently, uh, more flexible approximations can mitigate this phenomenon of underdispersion. So what I've shown here is for our, our Bayesian regression example that, that we've been looking at, uh, I'm looking at in, in these two plots, we're visualizing um, a cross section of the posterior distribution over two regression coefficients. And the uh, uh, the true posterior is, is visualized in the, this uh, sh shaded blue, and two, approx two, two approximations are, are visualized. Uh, their contours are visualized in uh, these kind of black and orange lines. Um, on the left, uh, we have an approximation that ignores any correlations in the posterior distribution. We can see that it's under dispersed and, and doesn't capture the, the kind of the off diagonal the, the, um, or the off axis. Um, uh, covariance in the posterior distribution over uh, coefficients. But if we use a more flexible approximation that, that is able to capture this, that is able to account for these correlations, um, then that is where, where we've now, if you like, increased the size of our green blob. Uh, uh, we're able now to capture uh, uh, quite nicely the, the the contours the structure of the, the true posterior distribution so yes variational inference is biased but uh, uh, it's uh, it's a bias that can be understood and mitigated and i would argue you know, we there are many situations where it's uh, um, uh, the benefits are, are well worth this the uh, the cost. Okay, so I, I have a quick question for you. Um, sure. So in, 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 in like low dimensional examples of this, um, you know, we can always check the fidelity of our posterior approximation by making such plots, right? Um, but once we go to very high dimensional models, um, do we have sort of automated diagnostics to guide us to, you know, in, in what directions we need to improve our variational posterior to mitigate, you know, some of the shortcomings. What, what is the general recipe for improving um, our variational posterior if there is such a recipe? Yeah, so um, it depends on kind of how complicated and high, high dimensional your model is because, you know, your posterior distribution can, can really be, uh, you know, extremely complicated, for example, in some, something like a Bayesian neural network. But um, so there's no, there's no general recipe. I think, you know, the, uh, there are a few different, there are a few different kinds of diagnostics. So uh, one um, diagnostic that, 
uh, we have available in Biro, and that I think makes um, can often be useful is um, to look at the the, uh, the distribution of uh, what are called importance weights, ratios of of uh, uh, model probability to to um, variational posterior probability, and, and in particular to, to look at the tails of this uh, distribution um, as a measure of, of um, uh, uh, the extent of under dispersion. Um, that's something that's advocated by uh, some of the folks who work on STAN, for example, which is another probabilistic programming language. Um, that can be a, that, that's, that's, that can be a good way of, of attempting to answer this question directly of whether you have a good posterior approximation. But another thing to keep in mind is that um, even if your posterior approximation is bad, um, you, you may still get good uh, predictive distributions. Um, and so it's also important to do these kind of posterior predictive checks that we saw in the Bayesian regression example um, to, to uh, look at the predictions of your model on, say, on held out data uh, and ask yourself you know, whether it's doing a good job of making predictions, whether the, the uncertainty, uncertainty estimates seem sensible. Um, so I guess the, the short, the, that was the long answer. The short answer is there are a few different things, um, uh, but uh, uh, I think generally looking at, at predictive distributions is the, the, the most important thing. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So, so far we've, we've uh, gone through uh, Bayesian inference and kind of the Bayesian workflow and mindset. And we've looked at, um, we've developed kind of this abstract idea of variational inference and develop some high level intuition for, for its behavior. But I haven't told you anything about how we actually optimize this loss function we define the elbow. Uh, uh, or, or how we might you know, go about implementing an algorithm like this. And it turns out that the expectation in the elbow is, is intractable by hand um, in all but the very simplest cases. Now, as with any other intractable expectation, we could estimate it with, with Monte Carlo. Um, by, that is by taking random samples from our, our approximate posterior Q. Um, but that still uh, leaves us with the difficulty of actually optimizing the elbow. It doesn't, doesn't really seem like it, it helps us here. Uh, one, uh, you know, one piece of inspiration we might take from, from deep learning and, and, and it's sort of rise to success in, in recent years uh, is to use, to make use of stochastic gradient descent where we perform uh, gradient descent on the parameters of our approximation using noisy estimates of the gradient. But uh, we're, it's, it's not immediately clear how to do that because the gradient of the elbow requires uh, an intractable expectation. That is the, the gradient is outside of this expectation and we can't, immediately move the gradient inside of, of the expectation because the, the distribution we're integrating over this Q phi of, of Z um, uh, depends on the, these parameters phi that we're trying to differentiate with respect to. So we need to work a little bit harder to find a way to reduce this to another Monte Carlo estimation problem uh, so that we can, we can obtain Monte Carlo estimates noisy estimates of the, of the gradient of the elbow. So uh, to, to get around this, uh, consider the slightly more general problem of uh, Monte Carlo gradient estimation for an arbitrary real value function f, which could include the elbow um, or some other objective. Uh, suppose then that we could rewrite the expectation in this, in this gradient calculation here um, 
so that the uh, it factors into um, an expectation over a new distribution that no longer depends on our parameters phi and a deterministic function of, of that random variable epsilon. So we want to rewrite our expectation over Q of Z to an expectation over uh, a deterministic function of some random variable epsilon, where now the only dependence on our parameters is uh, through this deterministic function G and our original objective F. And now if we can do that, um, because Q of epsilon no longer depends on these parameters that we wanted to differentiate with respect to phi, we can move this gradient sign inside of the expectation. That is the gradient of the expectation is equal to the expectation of the gradient. And that gives us a Monte Carlo, uh, an unbiased Monte Carlo estimator for the, the gradients of, of this stochastic objective, this expectation of uh, respect to Q of F. So the, this talk is supposed to be about black box variational inference. Uh, um, I've just given you this, this gradient estimator called the, the, the this, in the literature, this is called the reparameterization trick. And um, we'd like to, this, this gradient estimator is, is um, black box, that is the, the talk kind of lives up to the billing uh, because computing this for any objective function f only requires evaluating probability densities pointwise, sampling from a few primitive distributions, and computing gradients of deterministic functions, which is now uh, very easy in practice thanks to the rise of high quality automatic differentiation software. And that means that we can now apply variational inference to kind of a huge range of um, even quite high dimensional Bayesian models including models that, that combine uh, you know, classic Bayesian techniques and deep learning. All right, so uh, we've, we've gone through the basics of variational inference and black box variational inference, uh, and now kind of we can get to the, the fun part of, of uh, applying uh, this uh, powerful new tool to uh, the problem of representation learning and uh, uh, learning generative models of high dimensional data. So suppose we have a large data set of high dimensional measurements that could be images or, or genome wide single cell expression counts, a single cell gene expression counts. Um, in this case, our running example will be images of black and white images of handwritten digits. Um, We'd like to write down uh, a probabilistic model that will uncover latent structure in the data, such as the presence of multiple distinct clusters, but we don't know the true generative model. That is, we, we don't, um, we can't perform step one of boxes loop. We can't write down a model that will generate things that look like threes or fours or sixes or sevens. Uh, but here's an idea. Suppose we parameterize the, the high dimensional likelihood the distribution over, over observed data, the images with a neural network, then if we chose, uh, if we added uh, a latent variable with a simple or low dimensional prior, uh, we could use the resulting posterior over that low dimensional latent variable as a low dimensional representation of our high dimensional data. Um, but this leaves us with the question of, of how to fit the parameters of the neural network in our likelihood. And ideally, we'd like to we'd like to do that by maximizing the probability that our model uh, uh, generated our data, that is, the, the maximizing the marginal likelihood of the data. But computing the integral here is too difficult, uh, certainly not doable by hand for most interesting models, including uh, the deep generative model that we saw uh, that, that we were just looking at. Uh, but uh, Variational inference is, uh, uh, and in particular, uh, black box variational inference will kind of come to our rescue again here. Uh, so if we briefly recall the, the definition of the elbow from the, the earlier part of the talk, uh, of the elbow being equal to some constant uh, 
uh, minus the KL divergence between the, the, the approximate and true posteriors. Uh, it turns out that this constant C is exactly the model log evidence and marginal likelihood uh, log P of X that we were trying to optimize in the previous slide. Um, and further recall that we chose the KL divergence as a loss function because it's non-negative um, in part. Then the elbow or evidence lower bound is a lower bound to the model's log evidence for any uh, approximate posterior Q. So we can learn a model uh, just like we can um, uh, we, in addition to uh, fitting an approximate posterior, we can also perform model learning by optimizing the parameters of the model with respect to the subjective the elbow. That is uh, taking a gradient step with respect to the elbow on model parameters will and, and approximate posterior parameters will uh, um, increase this, this evidence, increase the likelihood of, of, gener of the model having generated the data and decrease the KL divergence between approximate and true posterior. So the elbow is, is sort of doing double duty here. Eli, how are you using the word guide there or is it not important right now? Uh, it's a, uh, I'm using it to mean approximate posterior. I should have uh, changed it to that, um, but it's just a, it's a, a, a word we use in um, a lot of pyro because guide is one syllable and approximate posterior is, you know, six or something. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it just means, just means our, our approximate posterior Q. Um, so we now have a recipe for model learning, something that would notionally allow us to fit the parameters in our the neural network and our likelihood. But we're not quite out of the woods. So suppose our model contains uh, a latent variable for each data point, like these low dimensional uh, latent codes Z. Uh, then uh, if we were to make kind of a, a, a typical um, independent approximation where we treat the approximate posteriors of each uh, uh, local variable Z as independent, then we're going to be left with uh, new local, new learnable parameters um, for each copy of this, of, uh, this uh, local random variable Z. And remember, there's one of these latent variables Z for each data point. So, you know, there could be tens or hundreds of thousands of these. And so uh, this leads to two problems, right? Uh, one is that the number of parameters grows linearly with the data. That's, that's too large um, to optimize. The other is that uh, prediction and model learning now both require nested optimization. Um, that is, we'll have to optimize, we, we, we potentially have to optimize the elbow to convergence uh, for local variables before we take a gradient step for uh, uh, on model parameters or uh, or attempt to compute a posterior predictor distribution. And that's too slow. So here's an idea. Um, we already put one neural network in our model. Uh, what if we put a second one into our approximate posterior? That is, suppose that instead of uh, having one new free parameter for, for each local variable, uh, suppose we trained a, uh, uh, a regressor, say a neural network, uh, to quickly guess uh, local parameters. Uh, from, from a given data point. Um, so now for each data point, uh, for each observed uh, high dimensional data point X, the, the local posterior distribution over the, the low dimensional latent code Z is now a learnable function of data uh, where the learnable functions parameters are global, that is they're shared across all of our, uh, all of our data. In this case, our images are handwritten data. And now the cost of storing these parameters is, is constant in the number of data points rather than linear. Uh, and this idea is called uh, amortizing variational inference because we're sharing the cost of, of optimization across uh, these uh, across all of our data points. 
Um, all right, so finally we have uh, kind of a, a complete recipe for applying black box variational inference to this problem of, of representation learning via fitting a deep generative model to high dimensional data. Uh, and this, this setup of combining a, uh, a deep generative model with an amortized approximate posterior is called uh, a variational autoencoder. Uh, these combine all the tricks that we've learned so far. Uh, and when we do this, we put everything together uh, we, and we visualize the, the, the means of these uh, local variables Z. We see on the bottom right here that the learned representations, if we plot them, if we visualize them with, with TSNE or UMAP, uh, the representations exhibit kind of a clear uh, class structure that um, reveals the, the, the underlying latent class structure in the digits, that is, you know, ones are separated from twos or separated from threes and so on and so forth. Um, and just to quickly recapitulate the, the actual computations that we're performing, um, the, that is the, the instantiation of our general black box variational inference algorithm for, for this uh, particular uh, model and approximate posterior. Uh, uh, our first step is uh, computing the uh, the parameters of, of, the lo of local posterior distribution. So applying our encoder neural network with some global parameters phi, uh, sampling some uh, values for, for those latent variables uh, using these parameters that we computed with an, uh, by applying our neural network to some data. Uh, computing probabilities of, uh, given these samples. So the, the approximate posterior probability, the prior probability of those samples and uh, the likelihood using our second neural network. We're going to, we're going to use these uh, probability densities to form our Monte Carlo elbow estimate. Uh, so a sum over a many batch of data points of this uh, log of the ratio of the, the uh, joint distribution of the model over the, the uh, approximate posterior. And we're going to compute the BBVI, the black box variational inference uh, uh, estimate of the gradient of the elbow. Uh, and we're just going to do that by differentiating this Monte Carlo estimate directly, assuming we've used a reparameterized sampler um, in step two here, uh, sampling the, the latent variable Z. And finally, we can use those noisy estimates of the gradient um, to take a gradient step on the parameters of our encoder and decoder neural networks in our, our model and our approximate posterior. Eli, uh, this is Luke. I have a I have a question about priors. So in the uh, in the example that you gave at the beginning of this talk, where you did the Bayesian linear regression, mm -hmm. you put priors on the parameters and um, of the linear regression, and those priors literally were encoding your prior belief about what those parameters should be. Here, instead, in this case, you said. For example, for the digit, you said that the prior was uh, the prior over z was just a normal zero one, and you said that uh, you can choose a low dimensional prior so that, in some sense, you are achieving dimensionality reduction. So uh, I'm a little bit confused if, in a framework like this, is it still true that the prior has something to do with your prior belief about the data? or it just uh, a mean to achieve dimensionality reduction? Well, it's uh, it, perhaps the, the belief that's being expressed is a little more abstract, but if, you know, it's still, if you think about it saying that uh, uh, you believe that the model was, the data was generated by uh, taking some underlying low dimensional representation and um, uh, you know, doing some compl complicated computation on that, that, where that complicated computation is shared across uh, all data points. So the, it's not that, that the particular, you know, standard normal prior that we put on these variables Z is uh, 
uh, profound or informative, but rather the you know, we've we've implicitly you know in formulating this uh, uh, this model, we've implicitly assumed that you know the existence, the possibility of of uh, there being low dimensional representations of our high dimensional data. That is, we're you know we're, we're counting on there. We're, we're assuming that there exists some uh, simpler underlying structure that uh, we should be able to learn about. So does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right, so yeah, um, one um, uh, brief final thing we could uh, uh, to consider here now that we've we've constructed a VAE and and gone through uh, all of the, the uh, computational steps involved. Um, we can now look at our results and ask uh, whether we can improve the model. So in particular, the representations that we learned if, as we as we look at the, the UMAP plots of the latent codes capture the, the class structure in the digits. As there's clearly these the representations clearly group our images uh, of digits into uh, clusters corresponding to to which which digit they represent. So our thought process here might be uh, to add a, a second class variable to our model to, to extend um, this uh, initial simple deep generative model so that our, our remaining, our, our continuous latent variable Z uh, more explicitly captures stylistic variation. That is, for example, the, the, the variation in different people's handwriting for the same digits. And we might also ask whether it's possible help the model learn this intended meaning for our new, our new uh, discrete variable y uh, by labeling a few examples. Um, it turns out that uh, before, we, before we get to the punchline of that, um, one more thing to note, we can't directly apply the reparameterization trick that we used for gradient estimation to discrete latent variables because that reparameterization is no longer possible uh, uh, due to the inherent discontinuity in uh, sampling uh, discrete variables like a, a categorical variable that takes integer values from say, well, you know, zero to nine. Um, we could uh, add in a particularly naive estimator uh, that's, un that's uh, still unbiased for, for the, uh, Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo gradients uh, of the elbow um, for this extended model. Uh, but even though the estimate is unbiased, it's also unusably noisy. So if we look at the, the if we measure the, the kind of goodness of fit by the uh, accuracy of using our uh, approximate posterior over this new variable Y as a classifier, it, it just kind of fluctuates around chance. It never, it never really did, uh, manages to learn anything at all. So a more sensible strategy might be to, to uh, uh, try all possible labels in parallel when, uh, when we're learning. And this is much more effective uh, than, our, our, than the more naive estimator that we used before. I won't go into the details of those, but um, the, the, the important thing is, is that our, this black box variational inference recipe can be extended without too much difficulty to include discrete variables which again further broadens the already very wide range of applicability of this, this idea of black box variational inference. Uh, and so the punchline of, of uh, doing this, of extending our model and fixing our, our gradient estimator is that we can now use the train model to perform class conditional data generation. So if I clamp this variable Y in the, in the model uh, uh, to zero, and I sampled, I now sample values of Z from the prior uh, and then uh, sample X from new, new values for X from the likelihood, we get stylistically diverse images of, of in this case, zeros. Uh, and if we look at the representations that we've learned, this, this variable Z uh, uh, and 
perform the same UMAP or TCNE visualization, we can now see that uh, if we color it the, um, the, uh, the points by their respective the, the, uh, class label, they, there's no longer any real class structure reflected in the, the, the uh, um, this distribution of, of continuous latent codes. That is, our, our representations have, have really actually done a, this, this model has done a pretty good job of disentangling class from, a digit class from kind of handwriting style. All right, um, so just to sum up, um, we covered a lot of material. Uh, we, we reviewed Bayesian machine learning um, through uh, inbox of loop and we looked at an example uh, Bayesian regression. Uh, we went through kind of the basics of uh, variational inference as well as, as developing some high-level intuition and a general recipe for applying it to uh, just about any problem. And we looked at uh, kind of an advanced application of variational inference, of black box variational inference um, to learning deep generative models and using those to learn representations. Um, and we learned about the kind of tricks that, that uh, and extensions to, variation, to black box variational inference that go along with that, uh, like uh, model learning with the elbow and amortizing um, variational inference. Today I'm going to tell you about Pyro, which is a piece of software um, and what you can do with Pyro. Okay, so just, just to give you some context before, before we go into details, <clears throat> Pyro was this software project that we started at Uber AI Labs. And in 2017, we, we open sourced it. We had been using it, <clears throat> you know, in-house for um, modeling com complex um, s systems with, with a lot of uncertainty and, and uh, experimenting with new machine learning techniques. After open sourcing, um, we found that it was used by a surprising number of other groups. We found it was used by um, machine learning researchers to develop new machine learning methods, as well as used you know, by uh, applied scientists uh, using Pyro for data analysis. <clears throat> uh, there were companies, both large you know, big corporations and startups that turned out to be using Pyro. It was really difficult for us to like measure who's using it because it's open source. And so like we'd randomly hear from somebody at a conference that their friend at Apple or something was using um, Pyro. Um, Pyro has also been used for to teach probabilistic machine learning in a number of classes. Um, and then in 2019, it was adopted by the Linux Foundation. That's kind of like a, one of these software foundations that serves as a neutral body to own pieces of software. So now uh, the Pyro software itself is uh, is owned by this this uh, foundation. Um, and then in terms of quantification, it's it's difficult to quantify these open source projects because it's it's uh, you know diff really difficult to measure things. But we can measure like citations. We have. Uh, the, the Pyro paper has over 200 citations. There are over 800 GitHub forks, uh, over 300 GitHub repositories that that depend on Pyro as like a, in their low-level infrastructure. Um, we have a forum that's really active with hundreds of med members and thousands of posts, and we have an active team of, of seven core team members. There are different organizations. Uh, the Broad, as 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 Murtash mentioned, Eli Martin and I are at the Broad, but we also have people at Twitter, Twitter Cortex, uh, two people at Facebook, and and uh, somebody at UI UC. And then the open source community has has uh, contributed a lot to uh, the Pyro code base and the and the NumPyro code base. We've had over 100 contributors. Uh, we originally had a backend that was built on Facebook's PyTorch library for deep learning. And since then, we have a second version of Num, uh, Pyro called NumPyro that's built on Google's JAX backend. That's kind of like the up and coming uh, deep learning framework. So it's it's grown into a, a, a big project. So in this talk, now that we have some context, I'm going to introduce uh, and tell you what deep probabilistic programming is and then get into the details of how Pyro in particular implements that. And then we'll walk through a, kind of an example workflow of how to use Pyro for some single cell RNA sequence analysis. Let's start with what a probabilistic model is. 
So a probabilistic model is a way of writing down uh, structured information in the terms of in, in terms of probability distributions that are connected to each other. So here on the left, I've written down a probabilistic model. We have some random variables that are sampled from probability distributions. Here I have three different random variables sampled from three different probability distributions. And you can see that the last one, um, x sampled from normal, the parameters there depend on the previous variables. Okay, so we can visualize that dependency in what's called a graphical model. You draw a graph and this just says, the arrows say that the parameters of x's distribution depend on these other random variables. We can also distinguish, notice I've, I've shaded this uh, node x over here. In probabilistic models, we, we separate these random variables into those that we can observe. These might be uh, counts or they might be you know, outputs of the sensor and latent variables that are not observed. These are things that we have to you know, posit exist. They, they correspond to concepts that come from science, um, but they're, they're more theoretical. Um, another motif that, that occurs very often in these probabilistic models is drawing multiple independent measurements. For example, you have, might have uh, multiple people participating in a study and you think of them as exchangeable or, you know, I, uh, independent of each other. So we, we often, you know, in science have multiple measurements. Uh, the naive way of drawing that in a graphical model would be to draw one node per, say, participant in a study or one node per data point. But we often summarize that using this notation of a box, and that's called a plate in, in graphical model notation. So this network down here um, is the same as, as this network on the upper right, but it denotes uh, a repeated element, okay? That's just a, we'll, we'll see that in the rest of the talk. I just wanted to you know, introduce this notation. So probabilistic models are, are really useful for a number of reasons. Um, we call these Bayesian models. They're really good at, for, at expressing prior knowledge. Um, it's, it's easy to be able to um, like express priors in terms of distributions and also in terms of, of the structure by which these, uh, ra these random variables relate with each other. Um, models, these probabilistic models are good at incorporating noisy data, you know, data with uh, noise that follows known distributions, at fusing data of different, uh, different data type. You know, we can fuse to totally different modalities of data into a Bayesian model by just having different uh, ob observed nodes. And we can handle uncertainty, not just uncertainty in the in the observed data, but also we can um, during during the course of inference, we can we can uh, predict the latent variables with with uh, known quant, uh, calibrated uncertainty estimates, which is different from a lot of machine learning where where it's difficult. You know, you can only get point estimates, but these probabilistic models can provide uh, good calibrated uncertainty estimates. And in particular, there's this, there's this notion of inference. These, uh, the, in the practice of probabilistic modeling, we separate, um, I think in, as, as Eli's talk, you may have heard of boxes loop. We separate the two practices of, of writing a model and then performing inference with respect to those models. And that's a very important distinction. So we can think entirely about a model and then think entirely about performing inference in that model. And here's what inference is. Inference is figuring out what the distribution, what we call the posterior distribution of the latent variables is that's consistent with the data we observe. So we think of there being a prior distribution as, as the distribution you know, before we see any data. And then the posterior is, is after we see data, what do we believe the distribution, the joint distribution among all the latent variables is. And these probabilistic models can provide not just point estimates, like what we call map estimate or maximum mean posterior estimates, but full joint posteriors um, that, that can tell us how these variables relate. And another advantage over, over classical machine learning of probabilistic models is that these latent variables can be interpretable. Um, we, can, we can make sure that these correspond to known concepts. Probabilistic machine learning is, is kind of a generalization of a probabilistic modeling that incorporates modern machine learning techniques. So a lot of the earlier probabilistic models had just a small number of random variables. In fact, random variable once denoted like a real variable and things that were, uh, or, or there's this term called non-parametric statistics, which means like anything that's not a real number, that's not a real parameter. 
Um, and machine learning really generalizes this to, to learn really rich sets of, of, of uh, distributions. Also, these machine learning methods uh, allow higher capacity models, which allow us to learn distributions over much larger data sets. So I'm going to go through about a history, a history of, of kind of probabilistic machine learning leading up to the present day, starting maybe 20 years ago. Um, so around 2000, uh, probabilistic machine learning was mostly concerned with uh, simple probabilistic models encoded as Bayesian networks. So here's an example of a, a model that we'll see throughout this talk. It has two plates, it has a bunch of nodes, some of them are observed, some of them are latent, okay? So this is like a Bayesian network with some plates. Back around 2000, there were a few different inference algorithms that were popular. Probably the most popular was Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, but Markov chain Monte Carlo, it was, it was very general and could, could be applied to many different machine learning models, but it was slow and it scaled poorly as the, the size of the data grow. It was often exponential in the, in the size of the data, the cost of performing inference. Another inference method that is uh, quite scalable was variational inference. But back in 2000, the, the, the class of variational distributions that were understood were very limited. They were, were limited to these what are called conjugate probability distributions. That's a particular small set of probability distributions that satisfy certain integrals or you can exactly compute uh, updates to model parameters. Um, and it was really tedious to compute these updates and it was a very limited technique. Every time you made a change to your model in, in boxes loop uh, after the statistician box, you, you write down a model, spend a month writing down, you know, an inference algorithm deriving some math. If you go back and change that model, you need, you, you need to spend another month writing that math. And it was really um, um, a, slow, a slow iteration. Another, and then there were a plethora of, of custom inference algorithms, but these were really fragile with respect to model changes. Sometimes statisticians would, you know, create their fancy hammer. That's a, you know, inference algorithm that works with some particular class of models. And they'd look around and, and um, you know, look for, look for nails. Uh, okay. Can you guys still see my screen? Yeah. Okay, okay. So let's fast forward. In the next decade, uh, another machine learning paradigm uh, gained in popularity. Deep learning became much more effective. Deep learning had been around since the, I don't know, the 80s or 90s, but around the, the early 2010s, it, it actually gained traction, partly because it could, it could uh, take advantage of GPUs, uh, you know, general purpose GPU processing became more widespread and, and these deep learning models could train huge numbers of parameters, many more than could be trained in, in these probabilistic models. Uh, deep learning adopted stochastic optimization, which meant that instead of um, looking at the entire data set at once and updating parameters, you could look at a little bit and make a random jump. And that means if you, if you can only need to look at each learning step at a tiny bit of the data, that means you can you know, train on um, basically infinite data, huge, huge data sets by looking at a little part of the data at a time. So that was, a, that was a, a huge advantage. They also took advantage of automatic differentiation. Automatic differentiation is great because instead of having to like spend a week rederiving some uh, uh, gradient update for some particular computing derivatives of these fancy you know, flexible machine learning models, uh, these deep learning libraries created a set of standard operations and packaged those with uh, differentiation or, or, or derivatives of those gradient operations of those operations. And so researchers didn't have to read, you know, derive gradients every time they um, wanted to try a new machine learning method. In particular, this led to many more experiments um, by deep learners because they didn't have to spend time at the marker board deriving gradients. They could spend time like playing around with architecture. So this, you know, just having automatic differentiation accelerated the, the re research in, in deep learning and allowed people to experiment with many more architectures, which led to like many more papers and you know, more rapid publication. And a final point I'd like to mention or point out in, in that, that, that was important in deep learning is the, um, the foundation of, of, of like software engineering or the value of software engineering. So I think this is often missed in, in, in analysis of like why deep learning is successful. Um, so a lot of machine learning methods up until deep learning had been, you know, somebody would implement a particular machine learning method, 
it would be published in a paper, maybe a grad student would publish it, maybe there's like one or two methods that work pretty well, and so somebody would build a library around those. But they were pretty bespoke. Um, in contrast, these deep learning libraries were, were a little more general, and so companies, like big companies invested in, in uh, reusable, high quality libraries that could then um, incorporate tricks from many different pa papers and they created these machine learning platforms. Here's kind of a timeline of some of the machine learning platforms, including like the latest, the latest few platforms are really high quality pieces of engineered software. Um, they have, you know, tests, documentation, they're, you know, they're really optimized. The hardware companies contribute fixes into them to make sure that they run really fast on all sorts of different hardware and there's just a huge amount of engineering effort that goes into these. All of these combined to make it Re, um, really easy for people and machine learning researchers, for example, to experiment with new methods. So for example, Ian Goodfellow um, anecdotally created generative and adversarial nets, a popular architecture after, you know, arguing with his colleagues at a bar one evening about architecture, you know, so he, he, ha he said like, you know, I think this is the right way to do it. And he could go back to his lab, code these up in an evening, and then the next day, get up, uh, you know, the draft of a paper together. And this is something that just couldn't have happened in, you know, 10 years previous because the, the you know, the really well engineered systems didn't exist. You couldn't just like go home and mash stuff together. You'd have to, you know, like he didn't, he didn't have to like redrive any gradients or prove anything um, or, you know, he, 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 I'm sure he did a lot of, you know, important work here, but he was building on a huge amount of, of, of well engineered software here. So now that we've seen these kind of two paradigms of machine learning, probabilistic machine learning and deep learning, uh, the next few years saw people trying to combine this, these two methodologies, right? There, there are some advantages to probabilistic models. There are some advantages to deep learning. And so people started using uh, deep neural networks in their probabilistic models. They tried to use uh, deep neural networks for inference to perform inference in those models. So let's see some, uh, let's see, let's see some of the advances that people uh, we're looking at around this time. Two of the advances were just like applying deep learning tricks to uh, probabilistic models. So people started, you know, replacing all that conjugate um, math that that was really kind of impeding the progress of, of variational inference. They started replacing that with just automatic differentiation. So that means people didn't have to, you know, these probabilistic machine learners deriving variational inference algorithms didn't have to spend like weeks at the marker board figuring out new uh, Update, update steps. Another was the application of, of stochastic variational inference or, or basically like these gradient, you know, stochastic uh, learning procedures, stochastic optimization procedures also to deep learning. So again, now these probabilistic models could learn, look at little pieces, you know, mini batches of data instead of the whole data set. So that allowed them to operate on larger piece, uh, larger data sources. I think finally that the most pivotal uh, realization was this repurposing of what are called autoencoders, a, a deep learning architecture for variational inference, this invention of a variational autoencoder. Um, so here, here's a picture of a variational autoencoder. These are a particular deep learning model that can be interpreted as performing probabilistic machine learning tasks, but they look just like a deep neural network, like the, the inference is still nearly black box and it scales with data. So let's look at, let's look at that a little more closely. So here's kind of two perspectives on the same variational autoencoder, okay? So an autoencoder, a non-variational autoencoder, like the original autoencoder, is just a particular neural network architecture. So the idea that this, this um, first neural network here is, is a neural network that inputs, say, a high dimensional image, maybe a you know, high dimensional piece of data, maybe it's a picture, it has a lot of pixels, and then it it runs it through a few layers. Each layer is smaller than the previous layer. And at the end, or, or in the middle here, I guess, there's this, what we call an embedding layer. And that's that's a really small dimensional, maybe like a 20 dimensional um, layer in the middle. And then there's another neural network that's trainable and that blows that back up into an image. Okay, that's, that's an autoencoder architecture. People really like these because if you train neural network to make sure that the input looks like the output, then what you get is kind of a compressed representation. You learn a representation of these images that's very low dimensional, right? So you can think of this as a, a neural dimensionality reduction 
technique, right? And, and people use these a lot now, uh, training embeddings and then using those embeddings for a lot of different purposes. So these two authors uh, around 2013 realized that if they added some randomness here, instead of Z being a deterministic output of Q, if they made Z a, a, you know, a sample, the random variable that was sampled from a distribution that was parameterized by Q, and they let the output be a, a sample from a distribution that's parameterized by this other neural network, then you can view the result as a probabilistic model um, with actually a probabilistic inference algorithm. So let's, let's take this picture over here and snip it in half and look at the two different parts of it, okay? So we can see that the first part is, uh, uh, we can we can view the Z as a latent variable, okay? A small dimensional, like a 20 dimensional latent variable. And then it samples from that, say an image, like a high dimensional object, okay? So this we can think of as a model. It's a model with some trainable parameters. And this other thing, this other half of the network, well, we could look at this as being kind of an inference model as a model, it's a different probabilistic model, but it performs inference. What does inference do? Inference draws posterior distributions over latent variables given data. And that's exactly what this is, right? It's a neural network that inputs data and then it samples a posterior distribution here, right? So this is what you might've heard Eli call earlier uh, in the previous talk as amortized inference. So what variational autoencoders are doing are linking these two models together in a particular way that trains them. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. But let's zoom into these two models. In variational autocoders, these just have like one latent variable or like a vector, right, of latent variables and one input variable. But let's let's see if we can um, generalize that to a richer class of probabilistic models and inference algorithms. Okay, so let's focus first on the the generative model part. Okay, so. Let's say instead of just being a single Z, instead of this single Z latent variable, let's say we have some sort of structure, right? This is kind of a general probabilistic model. I'm, I'll let's just say there's a single output observation, but let's say there are multiple uh, input random variables. Here's a, here's a probabilistic model representation of that. Maybe the input um, is even a discrete, <clears throat> sorry, maybe the observed data is even discrete, right? So what the, these, generative models do is sample latent variables and then produce some sort of observable output, okay? And in terms of VAEs, we can think of this as a decoder distribution, right? We can think of, so, so that's kind of a, a, a huge point there. You can view a probabilistic model as a decoder, okay? That is a huge insight. So let's look at the other, the other half, these inference algorithms. These are kind of models that go the other way that represent some sort of amortized inference. So these are a little trickier. This, we can call this an encoding. They input the observed variables and then sample some sort of posterior distribution of the latent variables. Now notice there are a lot more arrows here. There's actually more, uh, more uh, dependency structure. And it turns out that inference is actually harder than sampling random data. I mean, you, you might think that that makes sense because um, it's, you know, this P versus NP sort of problems, it's easy, to, it's easy to generate a random example, but it's difficult to like, or it's easy to verify that something is, is true, but it's difficult to uh, synthesize um, an explanation. So here there's a lot more um, dependency structure. The distributions aren't going to be simple distributions in general. These can be really complex. Um, and in fact, in variational autoencoders, we, we throw a lot of parameters in here and we, we have to learn them, okay? So we've seen, two networks so far. Remember, we have this generative model, that's kind of the forward uh, explanation of our data, and this inference model that runs backwards, okay? Now, the insight of VAEs is that we can view VAEs as, as kind of a deep learning approach to probabilistic modeling and inference, and they suggest this general in inference recipe, the seven-step recipe, okay? So the first steps are just to write down a generative model and express, you know, this generative model can express all of our prior knowledge, or sometimes as, as like in Eli's talk, it might just express some sort of, um, you know, high dimensional notion of decoupling. Um, but we, we just write down a generative model. And the second step is to write down an inference model. That's, that can be tricky, um, but uh, to save us, we can just throw a big neural network in there and add a lot of parameters. And if we have enough data, then we can just write a, a big complex model there. <clears throat> 
And the next steps basically take the deep learning paradigm and, and apply it right to probabilistic machine learning. So first, <clears throat> when we perform uh, training here, we train on output data X. And just like in machine, uh, you know, deep learning, we can train on just small mini batches of data. We don't have to train on the entire data set at once. We can train on just small mini batches. And then I think the trickiest part is that uh, we have to predict the latent variables, not from the priors, but from the inverse model. So there's this, this clever trick of connecting these two models as if they were a VAE, right? The VAE is one big neural network that's connected together. So we somehow need to connect these two, neural, these two probabilistic models. And so the way we do that is this. For this variable A, what are we going to sample it from? So here's, here's the choice uh, in, that VAEs make. We'll sample all of these latent variables using the inference model. And then instead of sampling those variables again in the, in the um, generative model, we'll take the samples that we sampled during the inference model and then replay them here. So whatever was sampled here at A, I'll, I'll, instead of sampling from the prior, I'm going to sample from that variable, OK? In Pyro, we say that we trace the inference model and then replay the generative model against it. OK, that's this kind of clever, non-standard way of sticking these two models together to make a single deep neural network that we can train. The next step is to define some sort of loss function. You know, in deep learning, we need some sort of loss function to train against. And so the particular loss we're going to use here is um, the evidence lower bound called the elbow. And that's equivalent to a KL divergence. That is kind of the distance from this approximate posterior to the true posterior. And it turns out, as you may have seen in Eli's talk, we can actually compute one of these things and we can actually compute uh, the gradients of these. Um, in fact, we'll use automatic differentiation to compute those gradients. And then we can do, once we have the gradients for each parameter, we can uh, update those parameters using standard deep learning techniques, you know, SGD or Atom or Atagrad or one of these fancy deep learning optimizers. So that's the whole recipe. Notice the last five steps didn't depend on the model at all, right? Nothing there depended on the particular model or the inference algorithm. That means we could just code that up in a library, right? We could, we could implement that once put it in a library and never have to think about it again. That means we can focus, whoops, we can focus all our attention on these first two steps, right? This is, uh, <clears throat> this is the only part that's problem specific, right? If we had a library, actually Pyro does this, if we had a library that codes up that last step, we could just focus all of our attention on just coding up expressive generative models and expressive inference algorithms. And if we can spend all of our attention here, we can, we can define, you know, really complex models. How complex a model could we, you know, how complex a modeling language could we create? Well, I guess the most complex language for describing things would be, say, programming languages. Those, those describe enormously complex objects, like enormous programs. So what if we could represent uh, one of these probabilistic models? Here's a graphical model as a program. So that's the idea of probabilistic programming. We use program to denote a probabilistic model. Here's an example of, of, of sort of a, pyro, a, a, a Python kind of cartoon version. It's not quite pyro syntax, but the idea is that we define, say, a Python function that represents this model. It has some sample statements when we sample from a distribution, okay? And it also looks like we have some shaded nodes here. Those are observations, right? And those don't usually occur in Python. So we're going to have to add some, maybe some sort of observed statement. So the model is going to input some observations and we'll have some observe, uh, an observed statement. Another thing we'll have is, uh, you know those plates that denote repeated structure in the graphical model? Um, like this part is repeated. We can represent those using uh, control flow in your, you know, your favorite programming language. Here, we can represent them with uh, just for loops. In Pyro, it's a, it's a little bit uh, different syntax in Pyro because we actually use vectorized for loops, so we can run these things on GPUs. But, but that's the idea. We represent um, probabilistic models by programs, and then we can take advantage of all these great um, tools for handling complexity in programs, like, like uh, being able to break functions up into multiple functions or having different modules or having, you know, these things lie in different files. So that's where we are today. Um, <clears throat> there are now a few 
that, that take this approach that use this kind of VAE, you know, stochastic variational inference approach and allow models to be expressed in Python. Python's popular because a lot of the deep learning frameworks are, are implemented in Python. And so if we implement our models in Python, then we can use these, these just these uh, deep learning frameworks. So there are a few uh, deep probabilistic programming languages around now. Uh, Pyro is the one that my team works on. Um, and NumPyro is another, uh, it's, a, it's a probabilistic programming language similar to Pyro. It's just built on a different back, back end that's more recent. And uh, Dustin Tran at Google has a probabilistic, deep probabilistic programming language called Edward uh, on tensor, on, built on TensorFlow. And then in the last, say, five years since uh, kind of the invention of the VAEs and, and the realization that this is possible, there have been a bunch of additional tricks for performing faster inference or more general inference or, or uh, in ways of implementing uh, particular inference models that generalize pretty well. Um, and these are actually really important. If you just implemented that, that recipe naively, um, it, it doesn't always work very well, um, but often these tricks can, can make it work. And, and these tricks can be the difference between, you know, not learning at all or, or, or having, you know, basically no learning uh, happening if, if you implement a naive implementation of um, one of these gradient estimators versus uh, like learning really quickly and having having high accuracy. So it's actually really important to, to get all, a, a lot of these machine learning papers to work in a single system. In Pyro, we've implemented, I think, most of these um, and, they, and they work together. Okay, so so far we've seen kind of an overview of, of what Pyro is or, or what, what, what deep probabilistic programming is in general. So now let's look in particular how Pyro implements that. So Pyro's inter interface uh, that you would use consists of kind of three layers, uh, primitives, effects, and inference algorithms. So the primitives are just the modeling syntax. So when we write a probabilistic model in Pyro, um, it looks like Python with a little bit of extra stuff. So we have like some Pyro sample statements and param statements um, and plates. Um, another layer that people work with is the set of inference algorithms. So we have an inference algorithm that's like SBI and a loss function that's the elbow, but we also have some other gradient based inference algorithms. We have um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and sequential Monte Carlo that are useful sometimes, but we, in this talk I'll focus on what, uh, variational inference. And then there's this um, kind of subtle layer that connects the primitives to the inference algorithms. There's this layer of what are called effect handlers. Effect handlers are a notion from uh, programming language theory that allow um, kind of context dependent non-standard behavior or kind of changing the behavior of these primitives in different settings. Um, this is a really subtle notion, but the, ma the main two effect handlers that we work with in Pyro are trace and replay. And these are exactly, remember this kind of non-standard way of of tracing an inference model and then replaying a generative model against that. So the way we implement this, this trick of con connecting two probabilistic models in Pyro is by using these effect handlers called trace and replay. Um, and these effect handlers are super powerful and we use them all around Pyro and inside our inference algorithms, but I won't talk about them anymore. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'll just talk about primitives. We're happy to talk about this really interesting you know, programming language um, theory stuff offline if you're interested. So let's look at those primitives. <clears throat> uh, so here's, here's just a, how these primitives look in, in some kind of disconnected lines of code. So here's, here's how we use the sample primitive. Uh, this, this line is basically saying sample X from a Bernoulli distribution, where this is the parameter. But we also wrap that with a prior.sample to give it a name, OK? Um, in particular, when X is sampled, Pyro can do some weird things here, like it can record stuff off to the side. Um, and once we're done here, um, yeah, once we've sampled that, X is actually just a, a, a tensor. So it's not like some weird symbolic object. It's actually just a, like, a, like a PyTorch tensor. It's numerical. You can do things with it. You can slice it and, and pass it into other things. So, so between these sample statements, you can do things um, like normal kind of NumPy like operations on X. So it's, it's just like py, Python code. So, that, and, and you can think of this as like sampling X from a prior. The other statement 
that looks like a sample statement is what we call an observed statement. So this is like, this one kind of represents the unshaded nodes and this sample statement kind of represents those shaded nodes where here we say that Y is observed, okay? This is kind of like a likelihood and this is kind of like a prior, okay? So this likelihood says that we believe Y is drawn from some distribution that depends on X and here was its value. And that's important to add to a probabilistic program, even though it has no kind of computational effect within the model. It's important when you're performing inference because if you know that y was observed from this distribution, it can give you information about what the values of x was. Okay, the next uh, primitive is uh, a called a param statement that we're using the notion from deep learning of, of what a parameter is. So <clears throat> here we say like theta is a learnable parameter. This is kind of a concept from differentiable programming. There's this um, field called differentiable programming where we specify a program, but there's some holes in the program and we don't know what they should be. And we say, well, just sit, call it a parameter and hey, machine learning engine, figure out what it should be. So that's what this param statement does. It says like, here's a parameter, it's named theta. Here's an initial value. This doesn't matter so much. It's only used once, you know, when you first access the parameter, you have to come up with some sort of initial value for it. And in Pyro, we can constrain that parameter to various different constraints. Those are really useful in, in learning parameters to probability distributions because probability distribution parameters are often constrained in some way. Okay, so we've seen three primitives so far. There's one other primitive that can be used a couple of ways that I'm going to talk about, and that's the plate primitive. So remember that square, the boxes we drew in probabilistic models that denote repeated motifs? And remember in probabilistic programs, we could represent those as for loops. So in Pyro, we have this thing called a plate, <clears throat> just like the syntax looks like in graphical models. And it looks kind of like a, a for loop. And it just means that we're gonna repeat this over and over. Uh, this, is, this version is sequential and it runs through the whole loop. And the, the version of plate we use more often in Pyro is, is called a, a vectorized plate. And that looks almost the same, but we use what's called a context manager in, in Python. Um, but this is really nice because it vectorizes and that means we can run on a GPU really cheaply. We can run all of these kind of branches through the loop in parallel. So let's see how we use these, these uh, primitives that we've seen so far. Now we're going to you know, combine them into an actual model. Uh, this is, again, this is just a toy model. I'll get to a real model in a moment. So here's a model. It's just a Python function. <clears throat> okay, we can write a probabilistic model now in Pyro. It's just a Python function. It inputs some observed data. We can have a param statement um, with an initial value and a constraint. We can sample um, C, say, from a categorical distribution, and that distribution depends on a parameter. We can have the control flow. And this is actually really powerful. We can have control flow that now depends on a random variable. And you can't write that down in graphical model syntax. Like that's already beyond the realm of, of simple graphical models, right? Already our, our probabilistic programs are more flexible than uh, simple graphical model syntax. And then within here, we can have a likelihood that depends on some other parameters. Oh, and look, here's a helper function. We can call out to another model. This is like a submodel. This helper function can be thought of as another submodel, but it looks just like a model. So here we have a, a Python a pyro model that's split between two functions and we really we're really leveraging like the modularity of uh, programming languages here we in theory we could like split these into big big um you know models that are owned by different people maybe we in pyro sometimes we have like components of models that we publish with the pyro repo and then you add that into your model and we can really split things up have different teams own different parts of a model and if, you know in theory we could collaborate on huge models um, Okay, so now that we've seen what pyro syntax looks like, I'd like to continue talking about pyro, but now really grounded in a particular scientific example. So the scientific example I'd like to focus on is uh, semi-supervised learning in single cell RNA sequencing analysis. So I'm not going to go into the too much of the scientific details because I think everyone on this call probably knows more about single cell RNA sequencing than I do. But let's just say that you have, you've uh, sequenced a bunch of different cells, say 20,000 different cells. And this, in this example, I'm gonna look at, it's uh, some peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Um, so let's say we, we have, <clears throat> we've separated using, using um, 
uh, microfluidics, we've separated 20,000 cells out. And for each of those cells, we can count uh, the RNA sequences of 20,000 genes. Okay, so what does that data look like? It looks like a big matrix of counts. Each of these uh, elements, entries in this matrix, this 20,000 by 20,000 matrix is a count value. Okay, so that's a, a, a piece of data. But suppose we have another piece of data, a total, kind of totally different type of data. Suppose somebody had figured out some marker genes that correlated with some sort of uh, cell type. Suppose we have four different cell types that we know, uh, that we believe we could, we could partition this data up into, the, the cells into. And suppose we can label a few of those, but for the others, it's unclear you know, what, what cell type it is. Okay, so here we have a dense data set. And aligned with that, there's this sparse data set of some hand curated labels, okay? So the model I'm going to follow here is, was um, created by some people at the Yosef lab, and it's called SCAN-VI, um, Single Cell Annotated Variational Inference. So this is an interesting model that's kind of representative of, I, I think, genetics problems that we could handle with variational inference for a number of reasons. So first, we have some prior intuition about the marginal distributions, but really only about like each entry of that matrix, right? Con like conditioned on a cell type, we believe that um, the, post the distribution over any particular genes RNA expression should be Poisson distributed, say, right? So we, we kind of believe that the, the, the marginals, that is the individual entries should be um, Poisson distributed. Uh, but we don't know about correlations. Like in practice, the expression of two different genes should probably be correlated among, you know, across different cells. Uh, but that's a really high dimensional correlation, right? That's a like 20,000 by 20,000 correlation matrix. Um, it's really difficult to specify any prior knowledge about that. But um, we can use latent variables to express uh, some sort of, <clears throat> or to induce some sort of correlation among those. Um, latent variables in general, we can think of those as, as uh, the, uh, identifying a mixture component and we can think of um, we can think of them as creating a mixture distribution uh, <clears throat> and in particular we can use neural networks to try to learn this really flex you know this high dimensional correlation structure we can try to use neural networks as a flexible class of probability distributions um, another advantage of the neural networks is that we can model other sources of noise here um, I won't talk about those in particular, but, but it's, it's a really flexible tool in our, in our modeling toolkit. So let's, this is, it's still, this isn't, uh, this is still a little bit of a cartoon model, but let's, let's look at a, a generative model for this particular data. Okay. So here's a, a graphical model and the, what, what this code is going to do just to overview before we go through the code. It's going to sample some sort of cell, cell state vector. And this is kind of like an embedding, like a, a latent representation that we don't really understand. And this might represent all sorts of things like where this, this cell is and its, its uh, cell cycle or what size of cell it is. <clears throat> and then independently of that, we're going to observe uh, or, or, or sample a random cell type. And let's just say that we don't know what the cell, there are four different cell types. So it's just gonna be like a random cell type. And then from that, we're going to sample within a, a plate, like for each gene, we're going to sample a count of the messenger RNAs that are expressed um, for that gene. Okay. And the, this is going to be sampled from a probability distribution that depends through a neural net network on these other two random variables. Okay. So this is going to be kind of like the, uh, the decoder. And we're going to have a decoder neural network in here. Okay. So let's look at what the actual code looks like. First in PyroCode, you, need to, you would need to define a decoder. And this is just standard PyTorch. This might be you know, a, a multi-layer perceptron or something, but you can just define some sort of uh, neural network here. Then we define a pyro model. So this pyro model is going to input some counts. Uh, that's the observed data. And we're gonna call um, a pyro.module statement. That's a primitive that just expands to a bunch of pyro.param statements. One for say, you know, if, if this decoder has a bunch of weights and biases in each layer, this just expands to like one pyroparam statement for each weight and bias in each layer. <clears throat> so think of this as just a, a fancy pyroparam statement. Uh, 
Okay, next we're going to draw two samples, one, one from the state, that's like this node, and then one from the type, and that's uh, from this type node. Um, and then within the plate, inside this plate, for each gene, we're going to sample a count, and the count will depend on uh, the state and type through a decoder, and we're going to use the output of that decoder as the parameter of a Poisson distribution. So this is a discrete distribution for the likelihood, and it's a discrete distribution for the class or the type, and a continuous distribution for the state. Okay, now that we've defined the model, let's define the inference model. Uh, and in Pyro, uh, because it's too it's too wordy to say uh, in inference model, we're going to call that a guide. So you can think of that as the uh, the encoder network. Okay, and the encoder network goes the opposite direction. See the arrows point the opposite way now. So now we're going to input some counts, and from that we're going to sample a type, and we're going to have to you know sample that from a neural network, and then we're going to have to sample a state, and that's going to be sampled through another distribution that depends on a neural network. So that means we're actually going to have to have two neural networks. So let's say we define you know not on this slide, but we define two other neural networks, one that's an encoder for the type and one for the state. Then we can sample the type um, from a categorical distribution now, and that depends through a neural network on the counts. Um, similarly, we can define, uh, we can sample a state that depends uh, through this neural network, um, which produces two parameters because the normal distribution takes two parameters. It depends uh, through that neural network on two different variables, which are the counts and the type. So that is this neural network it inputs the, the type, the counts, passes it through a neural network, and then samples a state embedding. OK? OK, so here's a picture of those two models kind of glommed on top of each other in the, in the, in the way that variational inference kind of combines them. So let's say we've defined this model and the guide. So remember that steps, what, three through seven in our little recipe for BAE training? <clears throat> here's how we implement those in Pyro. We create a variational inference object. We pass it the, the generative model and the inverse model, which is the guide. We give it some deep learning optimizer. This is just a standard, you know, SGD kind of like thing from PyTorch. It's the atom optimizer. And we give it a particular implementation of an of a elbow loss function. Uh, this particular implementation uses one of the enumeration tricks that we saw earlier. And that trick is really crucial in getting this model to actually train. Okay, so then this is really standard in deep learning. We train for multiple epochs. During each epoch, we split the data, we partition up the data into mini batches, and we can perform a learning step on a mini batch of data. So kind of all the magic of Pyro happens in this one line, svi.step. What happens at svi.step is that lines, uh, I guess, you know, steps four through seven or something in our little recipe, we, uh, run the mod, we, we trace the, the guide and replay it against the model. Uh, then we compute some loss, particular loss function, the elbow loss. Then we use automatic differentiation to compute some, param some gradients with respect to each of our parameters. And then we use this atom optimizer to stochastically update all of our parameters. Okay, so all of the magic happens in this, in this one liner in Pyro, this SBI.step. Okay, we run training and maybe we did run that on a GPU, so it only takes a few minutes, even though we have tons of data. Once we've trained, now we have a guide that's that's amortized, right? We can we can just use this and, and really quickly we can input some new counts and sample some and sample a type, you know, classify, randomly classify the node. Uh, this is really powerful because then you, you can do all sorts of things with this state. This state is one of these embeddings, you know, one of these, uh, it's one of these learned representations, right? We can plot this state in, uh, it's a 20 dimensional vector, right? We can plot it in UMAP, we can use it for downstream fires, we can use it for all sorts of different things. And the type is just a, like a class label. Um, oh yeah, so so the actual data, but I, but I just wanted to be completely honest the, car the cartoon model that we saw here in the guide is a little abbreviated but from the true model. The model isn't much more complex. It's still like under 20 lines of code. This is the model. 
This is the actual guide. It's still under 20 lines of code. Um, and it, it's just a bunch of pyro code, right? It has some pyro sample statements and param statements and plates here and there. It has some probability distributions here and there. We actually have five neural networks in the real model because there's some uh, additional effects we're, we're learning and we split one of those random variables into two, but it's just some neural networks. So like, this is basically though what pyro code looks like. It's like Python code. We have some pyro primitives here and there. We have some probability distributions here and there and some neural nets here and there, but that's it. It's just like Python code with primitives, distributions and neural nets. Anyone can do it. Okay, so here's the actual results of, of training. We can, we can train on this, on this data set of um, about 4,000 um, you know, counts per, per cell, messenger RNAs per cell. And again, we can run this on a GPU in, in about five minutes. Um, and so you can see here that indeed, if we, if we plot the, the cell state um, and color this by the learned label. Actually, this is the label probability, the distribution, the posterior distribution over uh, cell states <clears throat> that we can, that we can um, not, not just propagate these labels in a way that seems to be correct and clearly separates, but we can also propagate with uncertainty, right? It's not just like a point estimate that comes out of a machine learning method. These are calibrated uncertainty. So these cells on the periphery, you know, in, in, on the edges, in between these clusters, you can get really good calibrated uncertainty estimates. And maybe we, you know, we want to do some study and cut out the things that aren't uh, well well classified. Okay, so so far we've seen one example of pyro applied to. Uh, Sorry, Fritz, if oh, I yeah. can ask a question. In what sense are they calibrated the uncertainties? Uh, these are these are calibrated. Um, in the sense that if we got a new row of data or a new column of data corresponding to a new cell that the probabilities of our estimator would be a good way to bet um, um, which cell type the new cell would be. Um, that I mean calibrated in the sense of precision recall on new or held out data. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, on that note, I just wanted to say that. Um, so if you're running a few minutes over time, so um, just for those of uh, us who want to stick around just for a few seconds after we're gonna have a discussion. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for it. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'll skip to the last slide here. So thanks. I just want to say thanks to uh, my coworkers, uh, Eli Bingham and Martin, who uh, work on the fire project here at Broad, and thanks to Murtash for connecting us with a lot of other teams here at the Broad. <clears throat> and I'm kind of advocating for Pyro. And we're, we're, we'd love to collaborate on on um, on science. So uh, you can contact us at, at any of these places. Again, this Broad IO. Slash piracy. Uh, any, any questions? questions? Fritz, 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 this is wonderful. I, I, it says this, Alex. Sorry. Um, I think I think it's okay if you want to go over a couple minutes to to go back and finish your last couple slides, and then we can kind of move into the discussion after that. Oh sure. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that in addition to this example of uh, semi-supervised learning, there are a lot of other ways that we could apply Pyro. So one way is, is for example, Meritasha's team um, has been applying Pyro in their cell bender uh, removed background um, library. So St Stephen Fleming actually gave a talk, an MAIA talk on this a while back. Um, but in this, in this example, they're cleaning up um, background data and they combined they, they actually wrote one of these complex generative models um, and a complex you know inference model this is that you know guide um, but still it, they could write this just in pyro and then use the standard SPI learning another example that we've seen that we're not affiliated you know we're not affiliated with these people at all is using pyro for spatial transcriptomics so this is to fuse different types of data um, data at different resolutions 
and they're able to get uh, do kind of uh, super resolution imaging using a combination of, of data at different resolutions and, and, and measuring different things. Um, yeah, and in, in summary, I, I, I'd argue that probabilistic modeling is, is useful for science and that deep probabilistic programming in particular brings a lot of these recent machine learning methods, you know, from deep learning where maybe they're good at predicting ad clicks, but over to science where now we can, you know, incorporate a lot of prior information and, and scientific theory to create these kind of hybrid models. In particular, the, uh, these deep probabilistic programming automates inference and it leads to facts, faster model iteration, you know, faster cycles around boxes loop, which eventually lead to like better modeling. And that Pyro is a, this mature software platform. Um, and you should feel confident building stuff on top of Pyro, but that's all. I guess we could just move to discussion. Thanks for your attention, everyone. <laughs>